Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Next question. Okay, next one isn't really a question, but something I have noted that many of you do. You like to put the article a or an before your adjective, before an adjective, but you forget to use a noun. Do you know how like Mario introduces himself and he says, it's a me? When you forget to use some kind of noun after after your adjective or whatever, that you sound a bit like Mario's. It's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice what? It's funny to me like, it's a nice, or, it's a me. <laughs> you need to include the noun that you're referring to. It's a nice video or it's a nice explanation. It's nice or it's bad or it's good or this was a nice explanation. But don't forget to use your noun after you use the adjective. It's a nice something. It's a good something. It's a bad something. So please, uh, no article without a noun. Make sure to use your noun. And it should be in the singular form. If you're using a or an, you need to use the singular form of the noun. Don't sound like Mario. First question for today. Do you have an American accent or a British accent? A lot of you have asked this over the course of the years. I have an American accent. To be very specific, I suppose I speak with a West Coast American accent, not British English. If you want to know what British English sounds like, there are some videos on the YouTube channel with Gina, one of our other hosts. Uh, she speaks with a British accent. So you can listen to her to kind of pick up some of the differences between my accent and her accent, British English and American English. So thanks for that question. But yes, I speak American English. Next question. What does it mean they can't take that away from you? Who are they? And what does take away mean? We use the word they to mean generally just other people outside of us. This is used a lot to talk about like news or to talk about general opinions. They say that this pizza is the best pizza in the city right now. They say that your English will only improve if you study every day. They say that the most difficult thing you can do in your life is move to another country. They is just anyone. Second point, what does take away mean? Take away means to uh, some object that belongs in one location is removed from that location. Like take away food. In American English, we use take out actually. But take away food is a similar idea, especially like in British English, take away. So you take away your food from the restaurant. So you're taking something else. You're removing your food from the restaurant. So in the expression, they can't take that away from me. They, meaning other people outside you, can't take something away from you. Next question. How do we use the word cheers? When do we use it? Is it formal or informal? Please help. In American English, we use cheers when we're drinking. When we want to start off a drink with somebody else, we'll often clink glasses, so like touch glasses together and say cheers. We use cheers in this way in American English. In other types of English, like British English or Australian English, for example, people might use the word cheers as a way to say thank you or as a way to say thank you in advance for something. If my friend asks me for a favor and I agree to do that favor, my friend can say cheers to me, meaning thank you in advance. So cheers, it tends to be more on the informal side. It's not a super formal expression. If you want to use it in a formal situation when you're drinking with someone, you can use cheers. But in most situations, we use it informally, informally. Next one. What does the phrase don't be a creep, don't be a creep mean? Uh, I think Michael talked about this on an old English topics video. So I talked in a live stream about the word creepy, adjective creepy. So something that causes like nervous suspense is something that's creepy. The word creep is used as a noun. Don't be a creep, a person who is creepy. A, a guy can be a creep, a girl can be a creep. So a creep is someone who causes creepy feelings. Like, oh, something bad might happen. I feel nervous. Like, that person's a little strange, a little weird. That person is a creep. He's a creep. She's a creep. So don't be a creep means you should not behave like a creep. Don't create nervous feelings in the other person. Don't be a creepy person. Don't be a creep. Everybody, that's good advice. Don't be a creep. <laughs> Don't be a creep. Try to be a nice and understanding um, and respectful person. Next question. Hey Alicia, how do I make this sentence negative? Let's go to the park. If you want to make a let's blah 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 sentence negative, 
just put not before the verb. Let's not go to the park. Let's not plus some verb or some verb phrase. Let's not go hiking this weekend. Let's not watch that movie tonight. I'm tired. Let's not blah 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 to make a let's sentence negative. Thanks for the question. First question. First question this week comes from Iman. Iman. Hi Iman. What's the difference between is that how it is? Is that how it works? That's not what it says. That's not how it works. Let's start with the first expression, which is, is that how it is? This is a very casual expression that you can use to express like a confirmation, confirmation about a situation or confirmation about a status, but it's often uh, used with a kind of a negative nuance. So for example, if your friend makes a plan that you disagree with, but your friend refuses to change the plan, you can say, is that how it is? It's kind of negative and it's kind of not so nice to use. So is that how it is? That's the first one. The second one, is that how it works? This is an expression that we use to confirm uh, how to use something. Maybe it's my first time using an iPhone, for example. When I get something right, when I learn how to use something correctly, I can say, usually with an upward intonation, oh, is that how it works? Meaning, oh, is that the correct way to use it? So we use, is that how it works? To confirm the correct way to use something. So you can use this with a computer, with like a car, anything that you are learning how to use. Is that how it works? So you can use um, this expression as confirmation before you do something too. The next expression you asked about is, that's not what it says. That's not what it says is used to express disagreement about written information. Let's say you're making instant soup or like instant ramen or something, and you decide to pour cold water over your noodles to make the soup, but your friend says, no, no, look at the package. That's not what it says. So it here means the package and says refers to the written directions on the package. So that's not what it says means there's some mistake here or you've made a mistake. So the written directions don't match your behavior. That's not what it says. You can use this to express disagreement about written information. That's not what it says. The last expression was that's not how it works. That's not how it works. This is something that we use to express disagreement about how to use something. You use something incorrectly uh, that's not correct. That's not how it works. So I hope that that's helpful for you. Next question. Next question. What does play down mean? This is a phrasal verb. To play down something or to play something down means to decrease the significance of something. I don't want to play down how delicious my mom's Thanksgiving dinner was. Or I don't want to play down my friend's success. He's doing an amazing job. If something is really great or really interesting, or it could be negative too. To play something down means to make this thing seem less than what it actually is. If there's a scandal, for example, the president is trying to play down the seriousness of this situation. It means that it's a very serious situation, but the president is trying to make it seem less serious than it is. So to play down means to make something seem less than it actually is. Good question though, thanks. Next question comes from Kevin Wang. Hi Kevin. Kevin says, uh, sometimes I see sentences like, your dad must have had it for at least two years. Why do they use have had and what are the rules for this? So actually, uh, don't think of it as have and had being attached there. Instead, what you should focus on in this sentence is the must have here. So must have had. When we want to talk about a high level of possibility in the past, we use must have and then the past participle form of the verb. So in this case, the speaker is making a guess about something the listener's father uh, owned in the past for at least two years. So your dad must have had it for at least two years. So it's a past tense situation. The speaker is making a guess about the past, but the speaker is making a guess with a high level of confidence. So they use must have. Must have shows a high level of possibility. She's not here. She must have gone to work. The kids are in the car. They must have finished swimming. He's smiling at the office. He must have had a good meeting. So all of these are guesses, but these guesses show a high level of confidence. There's a high chance that the speaker's guess is correct. So the speaker uses must have plus the past participle form of the verb. Hope that's helpful for you. Next. 
question. The next question is about if conditional. There is no problem when you say the main clause first and you say the if clause after. Is that correct? Yes, that's fine. In the live stream, I introduced a pattern if clause first, main clause second, but I also mentioned that we can use main clause first and then if clause second. If I finish editing this video today, I can go running. I can reverse that sentence. I can go running if I finish editing this video today. Both sentences are totally correct. It's up to you to choose which order you like. Thanks for the question though. Good one. Next question from Mifta. Mifta. Hi Mifta. What is the difference between astronomy and astrology? Right. Okay. So astronomy refers to the scientific study of space. So that's like stars and planets, everything outside Earth. That's the scientific study of it. Astrology refers to um, the idea that we can make predictions, uh, make guesses about human behavior. Um, and those predictions are based on the positions of like stars and planets and things. And those positions can influence uh, human behavior, can, can influence our lives. Hope that's helpful. Next question. The next question is about the present perfect progressive tense. Uh, I said, I have been wanting to blah, blah, blah. Why did I use the verb want in the continuous tense as wanting? I use the progressive form wanting because from a point in the past until now, there's something I have desired, I have wanted to do continuously though. To give a strong nuance of the continuous nature of that, I use the, the progressive uh, or the continuous form wanting. I've been wanting to see that movie. I've been wanting to get a coffee with my friends. I've been wanting to get more sleep. I've been wanting to go jogging. Something you started to want in the past and continued to want until this point in time, you can say, I have been wanting. We can apply other verbs to this pattern too, like I've been thinking about you all week. I've been worrying about you all day. So these continuous past emotions too. We can use the progressive tense to talk about those. Next question is from Afif. Hi Afif. How do I study English speaking or how do I improve my English speaking skills at home alone? Yeah, thanks for the question. Check out this video. I talked about it in this video right here. I think the answer is at the 12 minute and 40 second mark. So there are several tips there for how to study English alone at home. Hope that helps. Next question. Next question comes from Ricardo Villarroa. I'm very sorry. What does one mean as a subject? One means any person. It sounds rather formal. In more casual speech, we say you. Like if you went to the movie theater, where would you buy popcorn? To make it sound more formal, we could say, where would one buy popcorn? Instead of using you, we say one. So you might see this more in writing or perhaps in situations where you is not appropriate or it's too casual. So one means any person. It doesn't mean the number. It doesn't refer to another noun necessarily. A lot of if sentences, like if one were a doctor, how much money would one make? One just means a person, any person. Thanks, Ricardo. Next question. Next question is from Oscar. Hi, Oscar. Uh, Oscar says, what's the difference between it's up to you and you're up to? Oh, okay. Uh, First, uh, it's up to you means you can decide. So for example, where do you want to go for dinner tonight? It's up to you. What movie do you want to see tonight? It's up to you. Where do you want to go for this weekend? It's up to you. You can decide. Your up to refers to things that the other person has been doing. So we use it in expressions like, you've been up to a lot of interesting things lately. Or a useful question is, uh, what are you up to? Meaning, what are you doing? As in, what are you up to this weekend? Or what are you up to tonight? to check what someone else is doing. You can also use this for the past. What have you been up to lately? These are very nice questions to ask instead of how are you or what are you doing? Up to you means you decide. What are you up to means what are you doing? Next question from Nita Apriani. I hope I said your name right, I'm very sorry. Can I say the ketchup on that crispy chicken was savory? The flavor was barbecue, teriyaki, or black pepper. It wasn't spicy. Ah, yes. You can say a sauce is savory. That's very, very common. So something savory, as we talked about quickly in the food live stream, flavors that are not so sweet, but that are still very, very flavorful. Something that's usually a little bit more salty. We don't really use savory to explain sweet things. It's more for kind of salty things or things that have a, like a really deep flavor about them. 
So yes, you can describe your sauce or your barbecue sauce or your chicken, whatever you put on your chicken as savory. That's a great word to describe. Thanks for that question. Next question is from Kiara. Hi Kiara, again. So what does sunglasses mean and what do sunglasses mean? Sunglasses is a plural noun. Should we use do instead of does? Ah, this is interesting. Okay, here your example sentence is a little bit tricky. So when you're asking about the meaning of a word, even if you know that it's a plural noun, don't worry about that in this example sentence. What does blah 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 mean? You can use anything in this pattern. This is because you're not actually asking about the object. You're not actually asking about that thing. You're asking about the word only, the word itself. So just use does. What does sunglasses mean is fine because you're looking for the actual meaning of the word. You're not asking about that actual object. You're not asking something about sunglasses. So in this specific example sentence, you can always use what does blah 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 mean. So native speakers do that too. What does something 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 mean if we don't know uh, an expression or if we don't know a phrase? We can use anything in that pattern. However, if you want to use a plural noun like sunglasses uh, or any other plural noun in a sentence similar to this, you do need to change. What do sunglasses do? Or why do pants have pockets? Or who do penguins see most frequently? Please use do as you would for other plural nouns then too. Um, but great question, nice point to consider, thank you. I almost forgot. There's one more thing I wanna to talk to you about. You guys did not ask this question, but I noticed it during the food live stream that we did recently. The difference between dessert and desert is one S in spelling. However, these two words are different. Let's start with the word dessert, the sweet food that comes at the end of a meal. Dessert is spelled with two S's. We use D-E-S-S-E-R-T to spell dessert. However, the word desert, which is spelled D-E-S-E-R-T, refers to like a dry landscape. Not many plants, not many animals live there. That's a desert. If you misspell the word dessert, and you forget that S, it becomes desert. Also, very interestingly, there's another way to pronounce the word that's spelled D-E-S-E-R-T. This is a verb, to desert. So to desert means to leave something without planning to come back, like to desert a town or to desert your family, to abandon something. Also, it can mean like leaving a military position, like so to desert the army. Please note dessert as the end of a meal and to desert, meaning to leave or to abandon something, have the same pronunciation but different grammatical functions. So please be careful of this point. How can we put them all together? I'm going to desert my station so that I can enjoy dessert in the desert. Ho ho. Next question. Next question comes from Kim In Tai. Hi, Kim In Tai. Okay, what does a spirit animal mean? As in, what's your spirit animal? I don't think we have that kind of question in my country. Also, what are some possible answers? Okay, a spirit animal can mean different things depending on the person that you're talking to. Generally though, on especially on the internet, we use spirit animal to refer to an animal that we think matches our personality or matches our behavior. So for example, if I'm a slow, lazy person and I don't like to do a lot of activities, I could say a sloth is my spirit animal. Um, or if I'm like an aggressive person and I'm alone a lot and I'm like maybe see myself as like a fighter or a hunter, I don't know, maybe I could say uh, a tiger is my spirit animal, for example. It's an animal that we feel closely matches us somehow. And it can change, like maybe on this day I feel a connection with this specific animal, so we can say that. Just do be careful, there are some people who have maybe a religious or a spiritual belief um, that strongly connects them to uh, a spirit animal, or you might also hear the word, uh, I think, spirit animal guide, perhaps. Um, but just pay attention to the situation, and I think you can quickly understand uh, how the person is using spirit animal. My spirit animal, I usually think, like, depending on the day, my spirit animal is either a flying squirrel or a platypus, because both of these animals are kind of like in-between animals. They have a little bit of a couple different animals in them, but, like, a flying squirrel is kind of, like, flexible and adaptive and has lots of energy and goes really, really quickly. But then the platypus is just like this silly looking creature that swims around looking for food all day and then sleeps forever. So like depending on the day, 
I feel like I'm sometimes a flying squirrel, sometimes a platypus, I don't know. First question. First question this week comes from Iman. Hi again, Iman. Iman says, what is the use of definite article the? We use the with a singular noun to refer to a specific instance of that noun. So when you're telling a story, we'll often introduce the first instance of a noun with a, and then after that, we'll use the to refer to the specific instance of that thing. So for example, a simple story. I was walking down the street and I saw a dog. The dog was really cute. I pet the dog. So in that situation, when I introduce a dog in the story, the first time I talk about the dog in the story, I use a to introduce it. Then after that, I use the to refer to that specific dog that I introduced earlier in the story. Every other time that I want to talk about that same dog, I use the before it. So use the word the when you need to refer to a specific noun or when you have to refer to a specific group. So for example, the teachers in the school district went on strike. So specifically, we're talking about teachers in a specific school district. The teachers went on strike. The mothers at the PTA meeting organized a bake sale. It's a specific group that is defined by something else. So in this case, the mothers at the PTA meeting only the mothers that were at that meeting, not the mothers from a different uh, group, for example. So we use the to, uh, to talk about a specific instance of something. First question this week comes from Dave. Hi Dave. Some people use LOL on the internet. What does it mean? Yeah, LOL can mean laugh out loud or lots of laughs. I've heard both. But either way, we use this expression to quickly explain we thought something was funny. LOL. Next question. Next question comes from Johnny. Hi Johnny, you wrote a very long message. Thank you very much for watching. There's a slang expression that I've heard several times and don't understand well. I know, right? Using I know right is like an invitation then for the other person to agree again, really. I know, right? So think of I know right as like an even stronger, like even more emphasis on the agreement and an invitation for the other person to agree again. I know, right? It's like, yes, and you agree too, don't you? Next question comes from Pavel. Pavel, hi Pavel. Pavel says, hey Alicia, please tell us about the difference between to not and not to, as in I want to not and I want not to, for example. Ah, yeah. So with these, there's not really a difference between these. Like I want not to and I want to not do something. Both of these are casual ways of explaining um, a negative in speech. The correct sentence would be, I don't want to do something something. Um, but like native speakers sometimes like to kind of play with grammar a little bit. That's one reason they might use this pattern, uh, either of these patterns really. Um, also, sometimes we start a sentence and we make it positive, like I want to, and then we realize part of the way into the sentence, oh wait, I want to express something negative. So we change it to to not or not to. So I want not to blah blah blah, or I want to not blah blah blah. Both are okay, uh, but just keep in mind that we use that I want not to or I want to not blah 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 in casual situations. We don't generally use these in formal situations. Instead, we use I don't want to blah blah blah. I want to not get in trouble. I want not to get in trouble. The correct sentence here would be I don't want to get in trouble. But you'll hear native speakers do this for a number of reasons. So there's not really a difference between these two. Uh, but you will hear both of those used by native speakers. I hope that helps. Thanks for the question. Next question comes from Zafar Ahmad. Zafar Ahmad, hi. Zafar asks about two sentences. Okay, one, have you ever cried in a film? Two, have you ever cried at a film? My question is about the preposition in or at. Which sentence is correct? And explain the reason. Of course, that will explain the reason. <laughs> Let's take a look at the first one. Have you ever cried in a film? Um, this is actually a point where the differences between British English and American English might come into play a little bit. Have you ever cried in a film? Could have a few different meanings depending on the situation. If, for example, you are speaking to an actor and you say, have you ever cried in a film? Meaning, when you were in a film, when you were acting in a film, 
Did you cry at any point in time? So have you ever cried in a film? It could also mean, have you gone to watch a movie in a movie theater and cried at the movie theater or in the movie theater? Your second sentence, have you ever cried at a film? So using at shows like the direction of an emotion. Like we use it with uh, other emotions as well. Like my mom is mad at me or my dad is angry at me. So it's showing the direction of emotion. So in this case, have you ever cried at a film? Meaning, did a film cause you to cry? Have you ever cried because of a film? Uh, in my case though, if I wanted to ask my friend if a movie had ever caused them to cry, I would say, have you ever cried at a movie? Next question comes from Sagri Karakilar. I am so sorry. Hi Alicia, can I use though instead of nevertheless? It looks as if their meanings are the same. Thank you. This is a great question. Uh, though and nevertheless, yes, while they do have similar meanings sometimes, they have different grammatical functions. So nevertheless means in spite of the thing that was said before or despite the prior thing. Nevertheless is used only as an adverb. Though, however, can be used as an adverb, yes, but it can also be used as a conjunction. Though can also mean nevertheless or in spite of. Uh, however, it also sometimes just has the meaning of but. Though I almost ran out of time, I finished the test with a perfect score. He told me he would call at 8, though it's 8.15 and I haven't heard from him. I almost ran out of time. Nevertheless, I finished the test with a perfect score. Her proposal was rejected. Nevertheless, she continued with her research. Hope that that helps answer your question, though. Next question. Okay. Next question comes from Igor. Hi, Igor. Why are verbs like bury, hurry, study, tidy, and try uh, in the irregular verbs list? Their past simple and past participle forms have ed endings like other regular verbs. And the course books used have listed these verbs in the irregular verb list. All right. Tough question because I did not create the textbooks and I don't know the logic that was used for the textbooks. Um, but if I had to guess why those verbs are included as irregular verbs, I would imagine it's because these verbs all end in Y. And yes, although the verbs do end in ED, there is an irregular change that happens with verbs that end in Y. So that's to drop the Y and add IED instead of just an ED. So we maintain that E sound like tidy, berry. However, the spelling of the word changes. Next question comes from Marcos Correa. Hi, Marcos. Marcos says, Alicia, help in all caps. Alicia, help the words weather and weather have the same pronunciation. And does weather have the same sense of if? Could you use it in some examples? Please reply. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're correct. Thanks, Marcos. Weather as in like clouds, sunlight, rain, snow, wind, weather and weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, they have the same pronunciation. Yes. And the W-H form, does contain the meaning of if, as in whether or not something. So native speakers will often say whether or not, but we can reduce this to if. Some examples. He hasn't decided whether or not he's coming to dinner. I don't know whether or not I'm going to travel this summer. Do you know whether or not your parents are at home? In each of these sentences, we could change whether or not to if. I hope that that answers your question, Marcos. Thanks. Next question is from Poria. Poria asks, what's the difference between these words, interior and internal, exterior and external? All right, well, there are grammatical differences. Interior and exterior are nouns. Uh, internal and external are adjectives. We use interior and exterior to talk about the inside and the outside of something. But internal and external are used, uh, those are adjectives. We use them to talk about the qualities of something. Next question comes from Kesava. Kesava, hi again. Kesava says, uh, what's the difference between bored with and bored by? Great question. There's no difference actually. Bored with and bored by 
also we use bored of bored of so these are all used in the same way to explain something that causes us to feel bored i'm so bored by this lesson i'm so bored with this textbook i'm so bored of you so we can use all of these in the same way you might find that some people have personal preferences for which one they choose to use uh, but we use them all in the same way next question from stanislav hi stanislav Stanislav asks, how do you politely address unfamiliar women and men? Lady, miss, missus, mister, and sir. Ah, nice question. All right. If you're in a formal situation, it's better to use mister with men. Sir tends to be used more in like a service relationship. So uh, the same thing with ma'am for women. Mrs. is used for married women. If I don't know if someone is married or not, a woman is married or not, I'll use miss. Nice question though. Next question question comes from Paul. Hi Paul. Let me ask a question or let me ask a question. Uh, which is the correct sentence? Both of these are actually correct. Let me is the reduced form of let me. Uh, so we use this in more casual situations. Let me ask a question. It's fine too. It just sounds more formal. And when we reduce the sounds, actually, it sounds a little more natural. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. That's fine to use in speech. In writing, however, L-E-M-M-E -M -M -E looks very casual, um, so we typically don't use that in formal writing. But both of them are actually correct. Next question. Next question is from Leon. Hi, Leon. What are the differences between test, exam, quiz, and questionnaire, and when should I use each of them? Nice question. All right, let's start with test and exam. We use these two words quite similarly when we're talking about um, tests of knowledge, or like examinations at school. We can use either of those. Like I have a test this week or I have an exam this week. I think in American English, test is probably used more commonly than exam or the long form examination. However, when we want to check the status of our bodies, we'll often use the word exam. So for example, a physical exam, that's an expression we use to mean like a full check of the body, which is commonly done maybe once a year or so. So an exam, um, like a dental exam or an eye exam, is a check of the condition of your body as well. A quiz is essentially a mini test. A questionnaire, however, is quite different from um, the three that we've talked about thus far. A questionnaire is something that's given usually to customers. That is for feedback. We use questionnaires for feedback. First question this week comes from Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Danielle says, hi Alicia, is it really a mistake to refer to animals with she or he instead of it uh, in cases where the animal is considered part of the family, like cats or dogs? Ah, okay. No, it's not a mistake at all. If the pet is like a member of the family, like you've described, it's very common to use he or she to talk about the animal. Uh, cats, dogs, we can use this for birds, hamsters, hedgehogs, whatever the pet is. Uh, very common. Also, when it's your first time meeting someone else's animal, uh, it's quite common to ask, is it a boy or a girl? And then after that, you can use he or she to talk about the animal. We tend to use it when talking about animals we are not familiar with, like a stray cat, for example, or maybe like an animal we see at the zoo. We would use it in those cases. When we're talking about animals that are parts of our family, we tend to use he or she to talk about that. Thanks for the question. First question this week comes from Silas. Hi, Silas. Silas says, hi, Alicia, how's it going? I'd like to know the meaning of the expression weird flex, but okay. And how do I use it in a sentence? Okay, this is a bit of recent slang. Weird flex, but okay, focuses in on the meaning of the word flex. So if you are interested in like health or like muscle training or anything like that, you might know the verb to flex. So to flex is what we do when we want to show off a muscle we have been training. So when we flex a muscle, we put energy into the muscle to make the muscle like stand out. We want it to look bigger, like we want to show off that muscle. So when we flex a muscle, we're trying to show it off. We're like excited about that thing or we're proud about it or something like that. So flex here in this expression, weird flex, 
does not refer to muscle, it doesn't refer to the body, but actually something else that the speaker or the writer is trying to show off. So it's something that seems strange. So in the example of muscles and muscle training, like the person who wants to show off wants to show their muscles. But when we use the expression weird flex, someone is trying to show off something that seems strange. And then we add, but okay, at the end to mean, I don't really understand, but all right. So to give an example of this, if I on Twitter write like, I spent $3,000 on socks this month, woohoo! And I talk about how excited I am. I'm like showing off that I spent $3,000 on socks. Someone might respond to me, weird flex, but okay. So that means like it's strange that you want to show off that you spent $3,000 on socks. Like that's a really strange thing to be excited about, but okay. So to give another example, uh, your friend might tell you something like, I have the biggest collection of rocks in my whole neighborhood. And you might say, weird flex, but okay. So again, it's like, that's a strange thing that you want to show off, but okay, whatever it is. Like, it's not hurting anybody. It's just a little bit weird that you want to show that off or you want to brag or boast about that thing. So that's what weird flex, but okay means. You see this one a lot online. I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for this interesting question. Next question. Next question comes from Dewey. Hi, Dewey. Could you tell me when to use any more and no longer? Sure. Okay. Um, so both of these are used to refer to an action, something we did or something someone did in the past. Uh, but from this point in the present, uh, that action is not going to continue. We use any more when we use a negative in the sentence. Some examples. I'm not going to go to that restaurant anymore. He doesn't help me anymore. They don't drink with us anymore. We use no longer in positive statements and it tends to sound more formal. You'll also see that no longer can be put at the beginning of the sentence to increase the level of formality. So you might hear this in speeches, for example. Using no longer at the beginning of the sentence really emphasizes that the action is not going to continue and that it sounds quite formal. So no longer might have a couple different places in the sentence. Let's look at some examples. No longer will we tolerate these problems. She no longer has to come to work early. We will no longer be a part of the group. So I hope that helps you understand some of the key differences between these two expressions. Thanks for the question. Okay. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Rigens. Rigens, hi Rigens. Rigens says, hi Alicia, I'm Rigens from Haiti. I'm good at English, but due to a lack of practice, I've kind of lost my touch because I'm sick and tired of the learning process. So I'd like to know how to keep my English up, please. Okay, um, first, I'm sure that you're not the only person. Like I lose motivation all the time. I would say that if you are having trouble keeping your motivation up, you should try looking for a different way to practice or a different way to use English. So for example, if there's a hobby that you have in your native language, you could try doing that in English. Or maybe there's a book or a movie that you are really interested in or that seems cool and you want to understand that in English. I would suggest trying to find something that's not like a traditional textbook or it's not a traditional way of learning like going to a class and doing worksheets and that kind of thing. I would suggest actually trying to use English in your everyday life to like do your work or to study something or to accomplish a hobby. Maybe uh, you make a new friend who can speak only English. So I would suggest finding something outside of a traditional learning setting to do. I think that that might help you a little bit with your motivation. That has helped me a lot in the past. Actually, making friends with people who cannot speak my language has been hugely motivating for me. And I try to study the vocabulary words that they often talk about. Uh, and I try to learn from their speech patterns too. So I would suggest trying to find something to do with other people as much as possible that uses English. So I hope that this helps you and helps other people with their motivation issues. It happens to all of us at some point in time, but I hope that these tips can help. Thanks very much for this question. Next question. Next question comes from Aravind. Hi, Aravind. 
Aravind says, what is the difference between took and taken? And have you ever been to India? Uh, okay, took and taken. Took is the past tense of the verb take. I took a break. He took my drink. They took our passports. Taken is the past participle form of take. Have you ever taken a trip to France? She's taken the test three times. We've taken long vacations every summer for 10 years. So I hope that helps. It's a difference in grammar. And no, I have not been to India. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Ahmet Farouk. Hello, Ahmet. Ahmet says, what is the difference between may and can? Okay, um, historically, may is used to ask for permission. Can is used to express ability to do something or lack of ability to do something. So that's the historical use of may and can. In today's English, however, lots of people use can to ask for permission to do something. We do not, however, use may to talk about ability. So let's take a look at some examples. Can I go to the restroom? May I go to the restroom? Can I leave early today? May I leave early today? So in today's English, these all refer to the same thing. They're all requests to use the restroom or to leave early. Uh, in today's American English, I would say that using may tends to sound a little bit more formal than using can. If you ever want to be sure to sound polite and to make sure you're communicating clearly, you can use may. But in most day-to-day -day conversations, we use can. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Pierre. Hi, Pierre. Pierre says, hi, could you please explain the difference between belly, tummy, and stomach? Thanks, sure, okay. Let's start with stomach. Uh, stomach is the most neutral word you can use to talk about this area of your body. If you need to talk about this area in your life somewhere in a polite situation, stomach is probably the best word to use. Examples, my stomach hurts. He got hit in the stomach. They've been doing stomach exercises every other day. So now let's talk about tummy. Tummy is a word that children use. Adults use tummy when they're talking to children. It sounds very young, it sounds very childish. Adults typically don't use this word when talking to other adults unless they're trying to be funny or unless they really want to sound childish for some reason. So tummy is really a children's word. Examples, do you have a tummy ache? I want to put food in my tummy. Now, belly is a casual word that adults do use. It sounds kind of rough. Um, it's not a dirty word at all, but it tends to be used more by men than by women, I think. It's a very casual expression um, to refer to your stomach, uh, but we usually use it to talk about eating and food. Some examples. My belly is so full. I need to put some food in my belly. All right, so I hope that helps you. In most situations, if you're not sure what to use, use stomach. You can't go wrong with stomach. Hope that helps. Next question comes from Giovanni. Hi, Giovanni. Giovanni says, hi, Alicia. My name is Giovanni. I'm from Venezuela. I've always wanted to know the meaning of the sentence, don't get twisted, even though it's not used very often. Thanks. Yeah, you're right. This isn't such a common expression. I found only a few references to this expression, and they were typically from music, actually. Uh, so this expression could mean, like, don't get angry or don't get upset or don't get nervous. So it refers to being in, like, a negative condition. So twisted. If you imagine, like, a towel. Do we have some? Oh, we do. Yeah. For this explanation, let's imagine, like, a towel. So a regular, just plain towel, when we hold the towel, looks like this. But if we twist the towel like this, it's under tension, like it's under pressure. So if we imagine ourselves as like the towel, like we're under pressure, we're really tight, we're really tense, we could be angry, we could be nervous, we could be upset about something. So if someone says to you, don't get twisted, it's like, chill out. <laughs> like, don't be upset, don't be angry. Relax, in other words. So I would guess that this is what this word means, or what this expression means, rather. But as you said, um, this is not such a common expression. We don't say, don't get twisted, really, in American English. You might hear people say something like, just chill out, as I've said, 
or maybe like don't worry or there are a couple of other slightly more rude expressions that we use too. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. All right, let's go on to the next question. Next question comes from Satish. Hi, Satish. Satish says, what's the difference between I shall and I will? Similarly, between shall I and will I? Ah, okay. Uh, first, any use of shall is going to sound more formal than will. The difference between I shall and shall I is that I shall begins a statement. Shall I begins an offer. I shall call the police. It sounds very formal. Shall I call the police? That's an offer. It sounds very formal. Will, however, is quite different. I will begins a statement, yes, but will I does not begin an offer. Will I is used to think out loud. So when we are imagining our future schedule and we're thinking about something in the future, uh, we're alone, we're talking to ourselves and thinking about our future schedule, we might use will I. So examples, I will call the police. That's natural, we would probably use the contracted form I'll call the police. Hmm, will I have time to go to the bank today? Will I be able to get a coffee this morning? So this is not used so much in conversation. We use this will I sort of pattern when we're thinking about things we might be able to do in the future and we're thinking to ourselves about it. So I hope that helps. That's kind of a quick introduction to the differences between these two. Thanks for the question. Next question comes from uh, Malik. Hi, Malik. Malik says, is this sentence correct? The color of shirts of players. Could you explain more about two possessive nouns in a row? Thanks in advance. Yeah, great question. This is kind of tricky. So in this situation, we would say the color of the player's shirts. So a key here is that we're using players and we're using an apostrophe after the S in player that apostrophe is acting as a possessive apostrophe. So we have two ways of creating the possessive in English. We can use of, as in the color of the player's shirts, and we can use the apostrophe s form. So for example, Alicia's would be Alicia apostrophe s. The apostrophe s shows something is belonging to me. That's my thing, Alicia's phone. So in this situation, we have players, players, here, we're talking about shirts that belong to players. So it's not just one person. When a noun ends with an S, we make the plural possessive form by adding an apostrophe to the end of the word, and we do not add another S. So in the singular form, when I said Alicia's phone, for example, Alicia is one person. So I write Alicia apostrophe S. In this example, however, because we're talking about a group of people, players, we don't use an apostrophe s because the word already ends in s and it sounds kind of strange to try to say like players or something like that. So to avoid this, we simply write players with s and add an apostrophe at the end. So this shows the plural form. That means plural possessive apostrophe there. It's very natural to use that apostrophe form of the possessive when we're talking about something that belongs to a person. So again, in my example, when I said Alicia's phone, it sounds quite natural to use that apostrophe S to show possession as a person. In the plural form too, player's shirts. It's a shirt or shirts that belong to a player. So when we're not using a person, when we're using like an object, it might be a little bit more common to see an of pattern used there. In this case, it's color of the shirts. So color is like a characteristic that belongs to the shirt, or in this case, shirts. So here, it sounds natural to use the of pattern because there's not a person here. We're talking about the characteristics of an object, color of the shirts. So of can be used to talk about like characteristics of things, and the apostrophe s form can be used to talk about like things that belong to people. Let's look at one more example though that uses no people. So for example, the color of the seats in the cars or the color of the car's seats. So we could use either of these patterns. 
I personally would probably use the color of the seats in the cars because we can clearly see like the levels of belonging. First we have color and the color belongs to the seats and the seats are in the cars. So I think that sounds much nicer. You might see that color of the car's seats sentence, though as we talked about, it's a little bit less natural maybe to use the possessive apostrophe there with car because it's not actually a person. I think you might use that though. I don't think it's incorrect to use that, uh, but I personally would prefer to use something that kind of clearly shows the, the hierarchy, the level of belonging or the levels of belonging as in the first example, the color of the seats in the car. I hope that this helps you. Thank you very much for this interesting question. Okay, let's go to the next question. Next question comes from Marcelo Oliveira. Hi, Marcelo. Marcelo says, hi, Alicia, are you okay? Thanks for your awesome videos. My question is, what's the meaning of gung-ho? I heard this in an interview with Taylor Swift. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, so gung-ho, let's start with an example. I'm gung-ho about my new project. Gung-ho means you are full of energy and you are excited about something. It means that you're enthusiastic. You're going to put all your effort into that thing. So when I say I'm gung-ho about my new project, it means I'm really excited, I'm really enthusiastic, I'm going to do everything I can to make that a success, gung-ho. So I hope that answers your question about gung-ho. First question from Harley Passol, Har Harley Passol, Passol, Pass, pa I'm very sorry. Harley asks, what is the use of get plus adverb or preposition? For example, I get down. This is a question about phrasal verbs with get. We can use a lot of different things after the word get. In your example, to get down, we use it when dancing, for example, like I want to get down this weekend. It's sort of an old fashioned expression though, to get down. We can use a lot of different uh, words after the verb get though. For example, get into, to get into something, means to become interested in something. You might hear to get at, like get at me, or get at your professor. To get at means to reach out to, or to communicate with, but it's a very casual expression. You can say get after, like I need to get after my homework, for example. It means to like chase after, or try to do something. Also, to get in, like to get into a club, to get into a restaurant, to get into a party. The nuance is that something is challenging, but you can gain access to that thing. Like I got into the party last night, but I wasn't on the list. There are a lot of different uses of the word get. I can't talk about all of them in this video because there are so many. So if you're curious about the various uh, phrasal verbs that we can use with the word get, check out a dictionary. That's a really good place to start. Next question. Next question comes from Long Ann. Long Ann asks, what is the difference between simple past tense and past continuous tense or past progressive tense? Simple past tense we use for actions that started and ended in the past. So the beginning of the action and the end of the action happened in the past. So for example, the sentence, I ate breakfast is a simple past tense statement. I ate breakfast. Ate is a simple past tense. The past continuous tense, however, or the past progressive tense is something we use to talk about an action that was continuing at a specific point in time in the past. If I want to use the past progressive tense, I can say, I was eating breakfast. Using that continuous Continuous tense, using that progressive tense implies I want to explain something else that happened at that time, or maybe I want to add some more information. So for example, I was eating breakfast at 8 o'clock this morning, or I was eating breakfast when the phone rang, or I was eating breakfast and watching TV at the same time. I was eating breakfast while studying today. By using the past progressive, I'm explaining that an action was continuing at a specific point in time, as in the example, I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, or I can use past progressive to show one action was happening at the same time as another action in the past. If I use just the simple past tense, I'm just saying a simple fact, in other words, this action happened. I ate breakfast at eight o'clock. Um, if I want to emphasize the continuous nature of the action for some reason, like I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, I can use the past progressive tense. In that case, it might be in response to a question like, what were you doing at eight o'clock this morning? So if someone wants to ask maybe uh, what you were doing at a specific point in time, like someone is suspicious of you, like, what were you doing last night? <laughs> you can say like, oh, I was having dinner with my friends last night. But past tense, simple past tense is something we use for actions which start uh, and finish. 
uh, in the past. But progressive, the progressive tense in past can be used to emphasize the continuing nature of that situation or that action. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe first question this week. First question this week comes from Patrick. Hi Patrick. Patrick said, I know the basic English words and I understand the point of two tenses. Uh, for example, I understand your video perfectly, but I have problems building productive conversations with my English speaking mother person. Do you have any tips on how to build trust with her? Um, I think that this was really good. Trust is one of the biggest things that you do. But I know that there's not always a perfect way to do that. So I just want to say two things. One is don't have confidence in something or don't know how to answer something. You go do it. Seriously, just Google it. I put quotation marks around like the phrase that I'm trying to make. And then I say Google for it. And if it's there, great. Then that means I can use it. Maybe like thousands of people have used that phrase and it is probably a common phrase. If there are no results, then that probably means I didn't use it. So that's maybe one good way to help you as you try to build bridges uh, through trust. So try that out. Next question. Next question comes from Yasin. Ya Yasin? Yasin? I'm very sorry. What's the difference between on time and in time? Is it you arrived just on time or you arrived just in time. We use on time to refer to doing something at the correct time, doing something at a scheduled time. So for example, I need to get to work on time, uh, meaning at the correct time, or did you make it to your appointment on time? In time, however, is used when we want to kind of give a nuance of rushing or hurrying for something. I need to leave my house now to get to the airport in time for my flight. I need to study for my test now if I want to be in time for the party later. You should probably leave now if you want to be in time for the movie. In time for something else. So I want to do action A to make my schedule meet this other condition, this other thing I would like to do or this other thing I need to do. In time for has the nuance of a deadline. We can use this expression in like a panic, like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it in time, like to submit a paper. I'm not going to make it in time. In time means like before the deadline, whereas on time has the meaning of completing an action or completing something at a scheduled time. Next question. Our next question comes from Gerson Silva. Hi, what is the difference between shade and shadow? Oh, great. This is a great question. Both of these words can be used to refer to a place that is darker than its surroundings because there's an object that is blocking the light. We can say there's shade over there or there's a shadow over there. In that sentence, they are used the same. However, shadow refers to the dark shape only. So a person can cast a shadow. We use cast, the verb cast with a shadow. I cast a shadow when I stand in the sun, for example. Shade, however, as a noun, refers to or has the nuance of a kind of shelter. So shelter provided by some other object, shelter from the light, shelter from the sun. So we would say stand in the shade because shade has the nuance of shelter. We would not say stand in the shadow. Shadow does not carry the nuance of shelter in the way that shade does. Interestingly enough though, shade and shadow are both used as verbs as well. To shadow something means to follow something closely. To shadow someone at work means to follow someone at work and, and try to understand their job, for example. Shade is used as a verb to mean to create shelter from light. For example, 
example, the canopy shaded us from the sun. Uh, shade also has some interesting uses. You might hear the slang phrase to throw shade. Throwing shade is a really interesting slang expression that we use, which means to communicate disrespect or to, to communicate like contempt. Uh, bad feelings for something. When you're speaking generally, in most cases, uh, when you want to talk about a dark, cool area, you should say shade. Stand in the shade. When you want to talk only about the dark area, that dark object, use shadow. Next question. Uh, next question comes from Long, who thinks that not all the words are followed by other consonants. For example, the and after and the. So yes, the H sound is often pronounced with a stop sound. It's quite difficult to Danny's second question, can you talk about ride and its uses, like take someone for a ride? Can I take a ride? Ride is another verb that has a lot of different uses. You use the example, to take someone for a ride, means to drive together with someone. To go for a ride has the nuance of doing something just for fun. It's just for fun. I want to take a ride to a location. I want to take a ride to the mountains this weekend, or take a ride to the beach. But to take someone for a ride means to invite someone to drive somewhere with you in a car. That's one way to use ride. You can also say, give me a ride. Can you give me a ride? So this is a request expression. I don't have a car. My friend has a car. I want my friend to take me in their car to a location. I can say, can you give me a ride to the movie theater? Can you give me a ride to the lake? Give me a ride is a request. So give me a ride in your car. So there are a lot of uses of ride. If you want to see all of them, or if you want to see more of them, I recommend checking a dictionary. There are quite a few, and I can't talk about them all in this video. So please check a dictionary. Question comes from Winston. Hi, Winston. Winston says, I don't understand English. I want to learn, but I don't know how to start. I'm a newbie. Right, lots of questions like this. Um, so really, there are a lot of different ways that you can start studying a language. Of course, we have lots of videos on our YouTube channel, uh, and we have a whole website uh, to try to help people who are studying English. You can check us out at EnglishClass101.com. Uh, you can find like apps, uh, you can find worksheets, podcasts to listen to, so that can be a nice way to start. We have some videos for beginners also, so if you're just starting, you can check some of the beginner level videos we have on the channel. For example, English in three minutes. That's a good set of videos you can watch to learn some basic phrases, I think. So that might be a nice place for you to start. But let's look at some other ideas for beginners specifically. One, join an English class in your city. Two, Get an English textbook and study at home. Three, make a language exchange with an English speaker. Four, study vocabulary with apps. Try out those, those are a few ideas. Of course, you can always use our videos on the channel as well. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, I'm sorry. Where do we use wanna and gonna and how? Ah, this question is about the casual contracted forms of want to and going to. So want to becomes wanna, going to becomes gonna in casual speech. We use them in exactly the same way we would use I want to, I'm going to, he wants to, she wants to, he's going to, she's going to. We use them in exactly the same way, which means we use them in casual situations like I want to take a day off or I'm going to go to the beach this weekend or do you want to see a movie tonight? We use them in exactly the same way. We use want to and going to, uh, but we use them in speech. Typically, we don't write these unless we're writing very casual messages like text messages to our friends or something. Next one. I got the next question uh, a couple times, like maybe three or four times. Okay. The question was about the adjective comparison video that we did a while ago. So I introduced the word fun uh, as an irregular adjective in terms of the comparative form. So uh, fun 
is a word, an adjective we use for an activity or something that's enjoyable, something we like to do. Fun is different from the adjective funny. Fun is an adjective and a noun, actually. Funny is just an adjective. Fun refers to an enjoyable activity. Funny, however, refers to something that causes us to laugh. It makes us laugh because something is humorous, something is humorous. So, for example, we can say uh, going to an amusement park is fun. It's not funny, it's not humorous, but it's fun. Let's kind of break this down a little bit. Let's think about it like fun uh, in the adjective form here. Fun is an enjoyable activity, something we enjoy doing. Um, funny, however, causes laughter because of humor. Something funny uh, is humorous. It is like witty or there's interesting wordplay or whatever. So fun is kind of, think of fun as like doing an activity. Going to the movie theater is fun. Going to an amusement park is fun. Watching these videos maybe is fun. I don't know, making these videos is fun. But funny, we use funny for, for example, a person or a movie or um, something that causes us to laugh because of humor. So things that are fun, 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 not fun, <laughs> funny, funny, not funny, not funny, funny, not funny, fun. So going to watch a funny movie is fun. Think about that. Because these two words are different, fun is an adjective, funny is an adjective, fun uh, the comparative form is more fun or less fun. The comparative form of funny is funnier or not as funny. So that's why I use two different uh, examples in that video. Thanks for that question though. Next question. Next question comes from Carmel. Carmel says, do you have any ideas on how to improve speaking skills in English? Yeah, well, to improve your speaking, you have to practice speaking. Here are a couple of ideas that you can use to maybe help you improve your speaking. These are ideas for just ways to practice, so chances to practice. Number one, get a partner you can practice speaking English with. This can be in your city or in your community. So find a partner to practice speaking English with. This can be a language exchange partner, for example. Two, if you can't find anyone in your town or in your city to practice speaking English with, you can try to find a partner online. Three, try recording yourself speaking. You can use your phone to do this if you like. Just record your voice saying something and then listen to it again. You might not realize it, but it's actually really helpful to hear your own voice like outside of your body. Actually, we have something on the website. Uh, you can check at EnglishClass101.com. There's a voice recorder function. So you can record your voice and then compare your voice to the sound of a native speaker's voice and try to practice until your voice matches the sound of their voice. So that could be another idea. Number four, try repeating the things the characters in English TV and English movies say. So if you're watching TV, if you're watching a video online, if you're listening to music, something in English, try to repeat the thing you hear. So not only listening, 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 but try to practice saying the things the characters or the artists are saying too. Number five, kind of a strange suggestion maybe, but try talking to yourself in English. Actually, I do this a lot. I'm studying Japanese and I talk to myself uh, in Japanese from time to time. So that helps me a little bit, but helps me get comfortable just saying words, saying phrases too. So maybe that's helpful for you. Those are five ideas for what you can do to improve your speaking skills. Next question. Next question comes from Huang Sena. Huang, Huang Sena? Huang Sena? I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, I've never been to Japan. I've never been to Japan before. I've never eaten horse. I've never eaten horse before. My question is, if you put before at the end of those sentences, does it mean you are in Japan right now or you are eating horse right now? No, not necessarily. Think of before at the end of the sentence as before now. I've never eaten horse before now, in other words. You could use this be just before you eat horse or just before you go to Japan, if you like, as an emphasis phrase. 
um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are in Japan now or that you're eating horse now. You could use it in that way, sure, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. If you'd like to emphasize it, like if you're about to eat horse, for example, and you say, I've never eaten horse before, you could show your interest or perhaps to show maybe some anxiety or nervous feeling about uh, what you're about to do. Um, but no, it does not necessarily mean you are in that place. Like for example, you could just be having a conversation. Have you eaten horse before? No, I've never eaten horse before. It could just be a conversation about it. But really, before just means before now. Next question. Next question comes from Luan Garcia. Hi Luan. Luan asks, I would like to know how to use down, up, off, in, on, and out after a verb and why it's necessary. Oh dear. Luan, this is a very big question. Your question is about phrasal verbs. These are all called phrasal verbs. Verb plus adverb or preposition. There are an enormous amount of phrasal verbs. I cannot possibly talk about all of them in one video. Phrasal verbs are necessary because they are part of speech. They are simply a type of verb. They are a type of expression. Uh, so you need to know them because they will help you to communicate effectively. Um, so if you want to know more about specific phrasal verbs, I would suggest checking a dictionary. Next question. Next question comes from Huang Zhang Ik. Huang Zhang Ik, I say sorry. Which one is correct? I work out for one to two hours a day. I work out for one or two hours a day. I drink coffee two to three times a day. I drink coffee two or three times a day. Ah, both of these are correct, actually. Um, in this case, there are very, very small differences between these. One to two hours a day means between one and two hours. Uh, if you say, I work out for one or two hours a day, it means it's determined, like uh, one hour only for a workout or two hours only for a workout. So the difference here is, are you determining, are you deciding one hour or two cups of coffee or three cups of coffee? or is it between those two amounts? So using one, two, two, or two, two, three means between those two amounts. Using or shows it's either A or B, but not between those two. This is the difference between two and or. Next question. Next question comes from Bowie Dente. Bowie, Bowie Dente. Very sorry. Bowie Dente asks, when can I use ever in a present perfect sentence? like I have ever. Ever means at any time or at all times. You can use ever when you're asking a question like have you ever blah blah blah, have you ever been to France, have you ever eaten ramen, have you ever taken a trip to the mountains, for example. We can use ever when making questions, that's one. But because ever means at all time or at any times, um, we may not use it to answer a question like that. Have you ever blah blah blah. We usually say yes or no in that in response to that. We can say I have never ever taken a trip to France or I have never ever forgotten my keys, for example. I have never ever blah blah blah. But in that case, it still means never. An expression like never ever just emphasizes the word never. So to use ever, we need to pair ever with a verb in a sentence. So we can't say I have ever, just I have plus a verb. We cannot say I have ever. That's incorrect. I have at some, at any time or at all times. It's, it's redundant. It's, it's not necessary. We can, however, use ever in a negative expression, like I haven't ever been to France, or she hasn't ever eaten cheese, for example. So we have to pair ever with a negative uh, to make a response. We use ever for present perfect tense questions and paired with a negative, have or has, to make a response, to make a negative response. So please keep those two in mind. Next question. Next question comes from Rashke. Rash, Rashke. 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 I'm sorry. Where do we use wanna and gonna and how? Ah, this question is about the casual contracted forms of want to and going to. So want to becomes wanna, going to becomes gonna in casual speech. We use them in exactly the same way we would use I want to, I'm going to, he wants to, she wants to, he's going to, she's going to. We use them in exactly the same way, which means we use them in casual situations like I want to take a day off or I'm going to go to the beach this weekend or do you want to see a movie tonight? 
we use them in exactly the same way we use want to and going to, uh, but we use them in speech. Typically, we don't write these unless we're writing very casual messages like text messages to our friends or something. First question. A lot of you have asked about what to do to get a, a voice that sounds like mine. When I'm making these videos, I'm specifically trying to speak clearly, so I'm clearly separating my words. The way that I talk with my friends and the way that I talk uh, regularly is a bit different than the way that I talk on this channel. But if you want to try to get this kind of pronunciation, the best advice I have is just to repeat this kind of pronunciation. It depends on your goal. If you want to learn to speak like me or to speak like somebody else that you really admire, you should try to mimic them. That's what I do. And that's uh, actually a strategy that I use when I study other languages as well. So if I hear something interesting, that a, a, a vocabulary word that a friend uh, has used, like in Japanese, for example, or they have a really good intonation, or just the way they deliver, the way they say something is really uh, interesting to me, or I want to, I want to be able to use that too. I put that in my head, I think about that, and then I try to replicate that, I try to copy that, essentially. To make this explanation shorter, mimic, <laughs> mimic. If you want to learn to speak like me, mimic me. If you want to learn to speak like somebody else, try to mimic someone else. But just keep in mind that the way that I talk in these videos is different from the way that I talk in real life. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Next question. Next question is from Suha. How do we write a good paragraph? Ooh, number one, you need to think about the position of your paragraph in your overall document. Let's think about writing a document in terms of three parts, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. In the introduction section, you need to introduce the key information your reader needs to know what they're going to read about later in your document. So if your paragraph is in the introduction, you need to think about how to introduce your information there. Second, the body section of your document should be where you include your evidence, your supporting materials, your opinions, um, any references that you have. So if your paragraph falls in the body of the document, you should have these themes in mind. If your paragraph is in the conclusion of your document, at the end, you should be concluding or finishing your ideas. It's typically a good idea to summarize the ideas you presented in the body and the introduction of your document in the concluding section. Two, use transitions. When you're writing, it's good to transition from one sentence to another and to use good transitions between paragraphs themselves. So some example transitions could be first, second, third, or next, then, Finally, after that, moreover, additionally, furthermore. So transitions help the reader connect the ideas that you're presenting in your writing. Three, avoid trying to include too much information in one sentence. Remember, you need to try to present your ideas as clearly and accurately as possible. So if you find you're just writing and writing and writing and the sentence is becoming extremely long, take a moment and look at the goal of the sentence. What are you actually trying to communicate? If you need to, break it into smaller sentences and connect them with transition. Next question. Next question comes from Garrison Silva. Hey again, Garrison. When can I use the expression take for granted? Take for granted. This is an expression which we typically use in the negative, like don't take something something for granted. Don't take blah 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 for granted. It means um, don't forget to appreciate this thing or this person. So for example, uh, don't take your parents for granted or don't take this opportunity for granted. These expressions mean don't forget to appreciate these things or um, don't just disregard your parents or don't disregard this opportunity. Recognize the importance of something. So if you are given a good opportunity, for example, or someone gives you good advice or a, a very nice gift, perhaps, we would typically use this um, with the negative. Don't take something something for granted. Meaning don't forget to show your appreciation for that thing or for that person. Question comes from Carla. Hi, Carla. Carla asks, how do native speakers use to have? I have seen, I've, I have got. Formal and informal. Sure, we use the verb to have for a lot of different meanings. There's a grammatical function for the verb have when we pair it with the past participle form of a verb, like I have plus past participle to make the present perfect tense, or I had plus past participle to make the past perfect tense. So there's that kind of grammatical function of the verb have 
However, if you just want to use the verb have in everyday situations, like I have a phone, or I have a camera, or I don't have any money, for example, then to have in that case just means to own something or to hold something, to be keeping something. So please consider the sentence that you're looking at with the verb have in it. If it comes before a verb in the past participle, it's probably a past perfect or a present perfect expression. If you're seeing something after the verb have, like an object, in my examples, like a phone or a camera or money, then it's probably referring to owning something or keeping something. So those are probably two of the most common ways that you'll see the verb have and its variations in at least American English speech. Next question. Next question. Next question comes from Daniel Silvero. Hi, Daniel. Uh, Daniel asks, what is the difference between wish and desire? Greetings from Paraguay. Hey, uh, what is the difference between wish and desire? Wish is used to express a, a want when you want something that is different from the present situation. So we often use it with I wish I were or I wish I could. Something we, uh, we want or an ability we want but that we do not have now. Something um, for the future. So I wish I could speak seven languages or I wish I had a million dollars or I wish I were taking more time off every week, for example. Something that is different from the present condition, the present situation we use wish or I wish you would call me, for example. I wish you would or I wish you could to express something that is not happening now. Desire, on the other hand, desire tends to be used more formally uh, and it also can carry more romantic nuances. It's not used as much conversationally as the word wish is. Wish is used to express wants, things that we want that are not true now. Desire is used more um, in romantic situations, um, like to desire another person, or um, he desired more of her time, for example, but it sounds unnecessarily formal, I feel. You might use it in a, in a more formal, like a business context, like our client desires more information about the situation. Um, that could be a different use of the word desire, but in general, it sounds a bit more formal and a bit more romantically charged at times, depending on the situation when it's used. If you're talking about a person as well, like if you say, for example, I desire you, it sounds actually quite odd, at least in American English. Um, if you want to use the word desire, I think in romantic situations, it might be applied in a phrase like, uh, he was filled with desire or she was filled with desire used more as a noun than as a verb. Um, so I would recommend not using desire so much to talk about your wants uh, as it can sound a little bit too formal or can give perhaps the wrong nuance to the situation. But wish is used to express a, a hope for something or wanting something that is different from the present situation. So I hope that helps. First question comes from Faris Ghazali. Faris Ghazali. How do I stop translating the meaning of English words in my head? I can tell you about the things that have helped me and maybe they'll help you. I put myself in situations where I could not escape into my native language. In my case, I could not escape into English. I would go out like for food and drinks with friends who could not speak English. I had no choice but to use a different language with them. Two, something that I've noticed some of my students do that actually kind of bothers me. They bring a dictionary to their lesson and they'll stop conversations in lessons to check words in their dictionary and say a single word at a time instead of just trying to find a different way to explain that. One, it totally stops the flow of conversation. Two, you don't have really the option to do that in a conversation. Most of the time you're not going to be carrying around your dictionary with you, I hope, unless it's in your phone, I suppose. Third, I think that this is a chance to develop a better skill. Instead of trying to translate into English or to translate into a different language, you should think about finding a different way Way to explain the word you want to use. Let's say, for example, that you want to use the word beautiful, but you can't remember the word. How would you explain that? So think about other ways to communicate an idea, even if you don't have the vocabulary word. So going to your dictionary shouldn't necessarily be the first course of action. It shouldn't necessarily be your first step. 
Think about a different way to communicate the idea you're trying to communicate. Think of examples to explain the word you're looking for and then the other person can teach you. Like if you're working with somebody or you're talking with somebody who understands you're not a native speaker, chances are if you can explain the word you're looking for, they will tell you. They will be your teacher. I just explain like with body language sometimes too if I don't know a word. So another thing that really helped me was not just studying vocabulary words, but actually approaching things as phrases. So not saying, okay, this word equals this word in my language, but rather here's a phrase that communicates a meaning that is interesting to me or that I hear my friends use a lot. I'm going to use that phrase. So don't just input, input, input. Start outputting too. So hope that's helpful for you. Next question, next question from Han Yon Hee. Han, Han Yon Hee? Am I Han Yon Hee? Very sorry. Hey Alicia, what's the difference between maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly? Great question. Maybe, probably, perhaps, possibly. Okay, maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. These are all adverbs. They have the same grammatical function. Maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. Maybe and perhaps are very closely related. Maybe and perhaps are, they have the same meaning, but just different levels of formality. Maybe is like the lower level, the more casual version of the word perhaps. So maybe I'll go to the beach this weekend and perhaps I'll go to the beach this weekend. They have really the same meaning, but perhaps sounds more formal. Probably, however, is different. Probably expresses a higher level of possibility than the other words on this list. I'll probably go to the beach this weekend is like a 75 to 80% chance the speaker is going to go to the beach this weekend. Possibly, however, possibly has more of a nuance of just that something can be done. It is possible to do something. We use possibly more in requests. Like, could you possibly blah, blah, blah for me? Could you possibly send me this file? Um, possibly sounds a little too formal for casual conversations and invitations. Uh, but if you're using it at work, for example, could you possibly meet me later this week? instead of could you maybe meet me? So the difference between maybe and possibly and perhaps there, um, possible has that root, yeah? Possible, able to. So maybe and perhaps don't have that nuance. Possibly sounds like, is it possible? Is it, are you able to do this thing? Maybe and perhaps don't contain that nuance. So uh, to recap, maybe and perhaps are used to express the same thing, a chance of something happening perhaps is more formal. Possibly is used in a similar way, however, it refers more to simple possibilities than is it is are you able to do that thing. Probably expresses a high chance of something. Next question. Next question is from Huang Zhang Ik. Hi, Huang Zhang Ik says, I'm curious, what do you do on your days off? You wanna know how to do my days off? On my days, I'm pretty normal. On my days off, I cook, I go jogging, I sleep, I, I go listen to my favorite DJs, I see my friends, I eat and drink and watch TV. That's about it. I'm a pretty normal person. First question. This comes from Shunichi Saito. Hi, Shunichi. Uh, Shunichi says, I want to know what does though mean? For example, it's very expensive though. I see the word though at the end of a sentence very often. Yeah, a lot of you have sent this question in recently. So I talked in a previous episode of Ask Alicia about using the word though, T-H-O-U-G-H, at the end of a sentence. It means but at the end of a sentence, and we use it kind of casually. So when you see the word though, T-H-O, it's like an even more casual version of though, T-H-O-U-G-H, at the end of a sentence. So you'll see this a lot on like social media, uh, you'll see this when you're on like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, text messages maybe. Though just means but, but at the end of a sentence. So in your example sentence, which was, it's really expensive though, it means it's really expensive but. However, it's like just putting that little but, that little disagreement kind of feeling at the end of the sentence. So it's sort of like a soft, you know, disagreement or a soft sort of difference of opinion. Though means 
though, T-H-O means though, T-H-O-U-G-H, uh, but it's just extremely, extremely casual. So for a little bit more detail, you can check this video uh, where I talked a little bit more about uh, T-H-O-U-G-H at the end of the sentence with some other examples. So I hope that that helps you. I know many of you have asked that question lately. Next question. The next person asked two questions. So the next two questions are from Essa Warsiadi? Warsiadi. I'm very sorry. Question one from Essa. Can you explain through, thorough, though, and thought? They sound similar. Yes, indeed, they do sound similar, and they even look similar in writing, for sure. However, these words have different meanings and different functions in speech and in writing. Let's look at through to begin with, though. Through means to pass uh, into something and to come out the other side of something. So, for example, to go through a tunnel, or if you're looking at a document, for example, to go through a document means to read through, read all of the content of the document from beginning to end. So through something is to, to begin at something and pass through all of the content, to pass through everything and come, up, come out the other side or to complete something. So if we also use the word through to mean finished in American English, like are you through with dinner or I'm through with my homework. So through, those are a couple of different ways we use the word through. The second word, thorough, thorough. So different from through. Thorough means um, comprehensive. Thorough means completely. Thorough means well done. It has typically a positive meaning. So for example, she was very thorough in her explanation of the word through, or she was very thorough in her explanation of the word thorough, sorry. She was very thorough in her presentation, meaning she gave a lot of information in her presentation. Thorough means well done, containing a lot of knowledge, a lot of information in something. Thorough. So please be thorough in completing your homework, or he wasn't very thorough in cleaning his room. So thorough means well done, completely done, finished. So considering everything, considering all points of something, even the small details is considered thorough. So we can use thorough for presentations, for activities that require small details, a thorough safety check, for example. So these are actions that are done completely, fully, to the small detail. So that's thorough. Next word here is though, though. Though, you can think of though in the same way you think of the word but. So it's used to contrast information. It's used to express a difference in something. So you could follow someone's opinion with an expression like though. So for example, I think summer is the best season, though winter is pretty fun too. So you can think of though in the same way as you think of but. A, though, B. So you're presenting A and then a contrasting opinion B and you're connecting those two ideas with though in the same way you would but. So though, though, although is similar. We use although and though and but in similar ways. What's the difference? But is much more casual and but is used much more in casual conversation, in everyday conversation. If you're writing a document, a, a formal document, or if you're making a formal statement, you could use though in place of but. So though shows contrasting information. The last one on this list is thought. Thought. Thought is the past tense of think when used as a verb. So I thought you were coming today, or I thought it was going to rain later, or I thought this was such a great afternoon. Thought is used as the past tense of think. We can also use thought to refer to an idea as a noun. So I had a thought, for example, or do you have any thoughts about this project? So we can use thought as a verb, past tense of think, or as a noun to refer to an idea. So again, that's through, thorough, though, and thought. Some of you might be wondering, how do I remember which is which when I'm reading or when I'm listening? You have to pay attention to the grammar of the sentence. They all have different grammatical functions. So you need to think about the grammar surrounding the word. Next question, next question. From Han Yon Hee. Han, Han Yon Hee? I'm Han Yon Hee, very sorry. Hey Alicia, what's the difference between maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly? Great question. Maybe, probably, perhaps, possibly. Okay, maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. These are all adverbs. They have the same grammatical function. Maybe, probably, perhaps, and possibly. Maybe and perhaps are very closely related. Maybe and perhaps are, they have the same meaning, but just different levels of formality. 
maybe is like the lower level, the more casual version of the word, perhaps. So maybe I'll go to the beach this weekend and perhaps I'll go to the beach this weekend. They have really the same meaning, but perhaps sounds more formal. Probably, however, is different. Probably expresses a higher level of possibility than the other words on this list. I'll probably go to the beach this weekend is like a 75 to 80% chance the speaker is going to go to the beach this weekend. Possibly, however, possibly has more of a nuance of just that something can be done. It is possible to do something. We use possibly more in requests. Like, could you possibly blah, blah, blah for me? Could you possibly send me this file? Um, possibly sounds a little too formal for casual conversations and invitations, uh, but if you're using it at work, for example, could you possibly meet me later this week? instead of could you maybe meet me? So the difference between maybe and possibly and perhaps there, um, possible has that root, yeah? Possible, able to. So maybe and perhaps don't have that nuance. Possibly sounds like, is it possible? Is it, are you able to do this thing? Maybe and perhaps don't contain that nuance. So uh, to recap, maybe and perhaps are used to express the same thing, a chance of something happening, perhaps is more formal. Possibly is used in a similar way, however, it refers more to simple possibility than is it is are you able to do that thing. Probably expresses a high chance of something. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Next question. Next question is from Muhammad Sohail. What is the difference between famous and popular? Great question. Famous is something that is well known. Many people know about that thing or that person. Beyonce is famous. The Statue of Liberty is famous. The Eiffel Tower is famous. Popular, however, means many people know about it and it is liked. It has a positive image. So like Beyonce is popular or like a famous candy is popular, like chocolate cake is popular. It's a famous food and many people like it. So popular is famous plus like a positive image. Sometimes we can use those two words for the same thing. So Beyonce is famous, Beyonce is popular, but famous doesn't always mean they are popular. So someone can be famous for a bad thing. In that case though, it's typically better to use the word infamous, infamous. Infamous means famous for a bad reason. So famous for something negative. On to question two from Issa. What does love to hate mean and when can I use it? Love to hate means it's something that you really, really dislike, but it's sort of enjoyable to dislike. So for example, this is an expression we can apply to reality TV. So many people think reality TV is not very good entertainment or it's not very high quality entertainment. However, it's really, really fun to watch. So maybe, for example, you just hate a character on a reality TV show, but somehow you enjoy watching that TV show too. So something that you feel very strong dislike for and yet you really enjoy it at the same time. That's something you can love to hate. You love to hate that thing. Next question. Next question comes from, oh, you wrote the pronunciation of your name. Very nice. Aitan? Aitan, I think? Okay. Hey, Alicia, I hope you're well. Uh, my level is intermediate. They feel that they're stuck at the intermediate level and want to reach the advanced level. They're watching lots of videos on YouTube, reading academic articles on the web, but still feel that progress has somehow stopped. Could you give me some advice? Okay, you say in your message that you feel your progress somehow has stopped. I have been here too, the intermediate plateau. Like you begin learning a language and it's like, yeah, I'm learning all these things. And then you kind of like plateau, you get to a level where things don't continue and you feel like progress goes much more slowly. I would say in this case, um, first, identify how you feel your progress has stopped. By that I mean like, do you feel like uh, your vocabulary is lacking? Or do you find that it's hard to listen to people and to understand what they're saying? Do you find it's hard to write? Um, is it hard to, to like to read things? So 
first identify what is that thing that you feel like you're not good at, and then start to approach your further studies with that as the focus. I think that if you can think about your different skill sets, your different levels in reading, writing, speaking, and listening, you can identify which of those four things is weakest for you and start there. So when you feel your progress has stopped, think, okay, what am I not good at doing? And then focus your time there. So maybe that's a helpful first step for you. Hope that helps. This week's first question is a question from Bahar, Bahar, Behar. I'm very sorry. Hi, Alicia. I'd like to learn about as and like. What's the difference between them? To begin with, like is a preposition. Remember, prepositions are words we use to show relationships to other words or to position the elements uh, in a sentence. So, for example, at and by and on are also prepositions. The word like is a preposition. However, the word as is a conjunction. A conjunction is a word that connects elements in a sentence. So, for example, and, but, or, for, so. These words are conjunctions. That's point one. We use like and as to make comparisons. The general agreement on how to use like and as at this point in time is that if you are following the word like with a simple statement, like a noun phrase, you should use the word like. If, however, the part that comes after the word like or as has a verb in the clause, there's a verb in that part of the sentence, you should use as to do that because as functions as a conjunction. Remember, it's connecting the elements in a sentence. So we should use like if there's just a simple phrase or a sim like a simple noun phrase, something like that after like or as. So to give some examples, my coworker eats like a pig. In that case, I've used the word like because after like comes a pig. It's just a simple noun phrase. If, however, I said my coworker eats as if he were a pig, I'm using a verb. I'm using the verb were, as if he were. So we can use as in cases where we follow the statement with a verb. We can use like in cases where we follow that statement with a simple noun phrase. Generally, we use them both to make comparisons. I'll say though that native speakers often make mistakes with this. Generally speaking though, especially in spoken conversation, in casual spoken conversation, at least American English speakers tend to use like more often than as in everyday conversation. I tend to use like. I rely on like heavily for my comparisons in everyday situations. It's like he were, it's like he was, it's like blah blah blah. As, I feel, is more common, at least among American English speakers, in writing. So you might see as if and as though. Both of those we can use to make comparisons. Like comes before a simple noun phrase, as is used before something containing a verb. Yeah, thanks for that question, Bahar. Next question. Next question comes from Kiara. Chiara, Kiara, Kiara. Kiara asks, uh... I'll help you studying and I'll help you to study. What is the correct one? Thanks. I'll help you something. I'll help you do this. So just the regular plain form of the verb I would suggest is probably the most natural choice. Thanks for the question though. Next question. Next question comes from Sheriff, Sheriff Ahmed. Sheriff Ahmed. Okay. Should I use the singular or plural verb after colloquial names? For example, my team have won the match or has won the match. Ah, okay, in this case, uh, my team has won the match. My team has won the match. So use the singular form of the verb, like same as like he has or she has. My team has is the correct answer here. Next question. The next question is from Taylor. Taylor asks, which one sounds better? I read a newspaper every morning or I read the newspaper every morning. Nice question. This is a question about articles. This is just about being specific. If, for example, there's a specific newspaper that you want to read, like I read the ABC newspaper every morning, you should use the. If it's not important to you to be specific about a newspaper and if you want to imply that you just read any newspaper every morning, you can use a newspaper. I read a newspaper every morning. Using the instead though shows that there's maybe a specific newspaper. Using the before a uh, newspaper in this case though sounds like there's a specific newspaper you read every morning. If you say, I read a newspaper every morning, it sounds like you just choose any newspaper that's available to you on that day and you read that newspaper. So using the shows that there's a specific or it implies that there's a specific newspaper you read every day. You don't have to be specific about which one you can, like I read the New York 
York Times every day or I read The Guardian every day, for example. But if you say I read a newspaper every day, it sounds like you don't choose the same newspaper each day. That's the difference between these two phrases. Most people, however, do choose the same newspaper every day. And so they use I read the newspaper every day. So you can say I read the news every day as well. But using that set phrase, the news, it's like the news for the day. I read that day's news every day, or I read the previous day's news every day. So usually we say the news. We don't use a news. It sounds a little strange to use a news. So the same sort of thing applies to a newspaper. Most people choose the same newspaper every day, so we say the newspaper instead of a newspaper. But thanks for that question, Taylor. Nice. Next question. Next question comes from Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. Jeffrey asks, sometimes I watch movies and some characters say, you wish, with a very angry attitude, or I wish in other situations. What do these two sentences mean and how do I use it? Aha, interesting question. Okay, when someone responds with you wish to a negative suggestion, it's like they're mutually together they're recognizing that they don't like each other. So usually the first character will say something like make a negative suggestion like you should uh, you should leave town and get a different job like leave us alone something like that and then the other character will say yeah you wish like yes this this character recognizes you want me to do that yes but I'm not going to do that in other words so it's sort of like a challenge so this person says like this negative suggestion the other person recognizes the suggestion and says no I'm not going to do that but I know you want me to do that so you wish in this way means it's like a negative challenge like they're kind of fighting recognizing they dislike each other so that's one the other one what was the other one so I wish we talked about I wish in the previous the previous episode of Ask Felicia so please check that out but essentially I wish refers to something that uh, we cannot do now or something that is different from the present situation but we want uh, we want to happen we want to be able to do so please check the last episode of Ask Alicia for more about I wish like the positive news. next question next question comes from brain Brian Brian I'm very sorry hey Alicia what's your height I am 1,000 centimeters tall or maybe I'm six centimeters tall this whole thing has just been a scam the entire time next question next question comes from Bowie Dente Bowie Bowie Dente very sorry Bowie Dente asks when can I use ever in a present perfect sentence like I have ever ever means at any time or at all times you can use ever when you're asking a question like have you ever blah 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 have you ever been to France have you ever eaten ramen have you ever taken a trip to the mountains for example we can use ever when making questions that's one but because ever means at all time or at any times um, we may not use it to answer a question like that have you ever blah 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 we usually say yes or no in that in response to that we can say I have never ever taken a trip to France or I have never ever forgotten my keys for example I have never ever blah 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 but in that case it still means never an expression like never ever just emphasizes the word never so to use ever we need to pair ever with a verb in a sentence so we can't say I have ever just I have plus a verb we cannot say I have ever that's incorrect I have at some at any time or at all times it's it's redundant it's it's not necessary we can however use ever in a negative expression like I haven't ever been to France or she hasn't ever eaten cheese for example so we have to pair ever with a negative uh, to make a response we use ever for present perfect tense questions and paired with a negative have or has to make a response to make a negative response so please keep those two in mind first question from Harley Passol Har Harley Passol Passol Pass pa I'm very sorry Harley asks what is the use of get plus adverb or preposition for example I get down this is a question about phrasal verbs with get we can use a lot of different things after the word get in your example to get down we use it when dancing for example like I want to get down this weekend it's sort of an old-fashioned expression though to get down we can use a lot of different uh, words after the verb get though for example get into to get into something 
means to become interested in something. You might hear to get at, like get at me, or get at your professor. To get at means to reach out to or to communicate with, but it's a very casual expression. We can say get after, like I need to get after my homework, for example. It means to like chase after or try to do something. Also, to get in, like to get into a club, to get into a restaurant, to get into a party. The nuance is that something is challenging, but you can gain access to that thing. Like, I got into the party last night, but I wasn't on the list. There are a lot of different uses of the word get. I can't talk about all of them in this video because there are so many. So if you're curious about the various uh, phrasal verbs that we can use with the word get, check out a dictionary. That's a really good place to start. Next question comes from uh, Alexander. Hi, Alexander. Alexander says, hi, Alicia. What's the difference between the words intelligent, smart, and clever? Intelligent and smart have the same meaning. They mean someone who has a lot of knowledge and the image is that they got it from like books, from studying, from classrooms, from lectures. Intelligent and smart, they have that same feeling about them, but intelligent sounds more formal. Smart is used uh, a lot among young people who have good academic abilities, for example. Clever also means that someone has a lot of knowledge, but the idea with clever, maybe they have knowledge from books and classes, yes, but their knowledge is from world experience. So they're really good with like people and situations and they can think quickly maybe, and they have good ideas. That's someone who is clever. Sometimes clever has the image of being a little bit like sneaky too. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Next question. Next question comes from Long Ann. Long Ann asks, what is the difference between simple past tense and past continuous tense or past progressive tense? Simple past tense we use for actions that started and ended in the past. So the beginning of the action and the end of the action happened in the past. So for example, the sentence, I ate breakfast is a simple past tense statement. I ate breakfast. Ate is the simple past tense. The past continuous tense, however, or the past progressive tense is something we use to talk about an action that was continuing at a specific point in time in the past. If I want to use the past progressive tense, I can say, I was eating eating breakfast. Using that continuous tense, using that progressive tense implies I want to explain something else that happened at that time, or maybe I want to add some more information. So for example, I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock this morning, or I was eating breakfast when the phone rang, or I was eating breakfast and watching TV at the same time. I was eating breakfast while studying today. By using the past progressive, I'm explaining that an action was continuing at a specific point in time, as in the example, I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, or I can use past progressive to show one action was happening at the same time as another action in the past. If I use just the simple past tense, I'm just saying a simple fact, in other words, this action happened. I ate breakfast at eight o'clock. Um, if I want to emphasize the continuous nature of the action for some reason, like I was eating breakfast at eight o'clock, I can use the past progressive tense. In that case, it might be in response to a question like, what were you doing at eight o'clock this morning? So if someone wants to ask maybe uh, what you were doing at a specific point in time, like someone is suspicious of you, like, what were you doing last night? <laughs> you can say like, oh, I was having dinner with my friends last night. But past tense, simple past tense is something we use for actions which start uh, and finish uh, in the past. But progressive, the progressive tense in past can be used to emphasize the continuing nature of that situation or that action. First question this week comes from Eduardo. Hi, Eduardo. Could you explain, please, how to use the expressions one, at all, two, kind of, three, actually, four, a big picture? Sure. Number one, at all. We use at all as an emphasis phrase after negative statements. I don't want to study at all today. He doesn't like me at all. We can also use this expression in question. Question two about kind of. It depends on which expression you mean. There's kind of, which can mean a little bit or somewhat. I kind of want to eat Vietnamese food for dinner. You'll also notice that the pronunciation there changes to kinda, kinda. Not kind of, but kinda, 
kind of. Depending on the way the sentence is made, though, kind of can also refer to types of something. What kind of ice cream do you like? They don't know what kind of house they want. Here, kind of means type. So they don't know what kind of house they want. They don't know what kind of food they want to eat for dinner, for example. So check to see which way kind of is being used. If it's coming before a verb, like I kind of want to eat or I kind of want to go, then it probably means a little bit. But if it's coming before a noun, then it probably means type of noun. So I hope that helps. Third question about the word actually. Actually, right. We use the word actually when we want to explain the real situation as we understand it. So people like to use actually, actually to introduce their opinion as though it's fact sometimes. So some examples of this. Actually, I don't live in the United States. I don't think he actually likes chocolate. So in these ways, we're introducing a real situation as we understand it. We use actually to do that. Your fourth question is about a uh, big picture. Big picture is used to talk about a broad idea of something. So going away from a small detail and talking about like the entire situation at one time. I know you think studying vocabulary is boring, but look at the big picture. It's important to know small details. He's losing sight of the big picture. He's wasting time and money. So the big picture is kind of like maybe a, the, the bigger situation. Hope that helps. Next question. Next question comes from Yasin. Ya Yasin? Yasin? I'm very sorry. What's the difference between on time and in time? Is it you arrived just on time or you arrived just in time? We use on time to refer to doing something at the correct time. Time, doing something at a scheduled time. So for example, I need to get to work on time, uh, meaning at the correct time. Or did you make it to your appointment on time? In time, however, is used when we want to kind of give a nuance of rushing or hurrying for something. I need to leave my house now to get to the airport in time for my flight. I need to study for my test now if I want to be in time for the party later. You should probably leave now if you want to be in time for the movie. In time for something else. So I want to do action A to make my schedule meet this other condition, this other thing I would like to do or this other thing I need to do. In time for has the nuance of a deadline. We can use this expression in like a panic, like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it in time, like to submit a paper. I'm not going to make it in time. In time means like before the deadline, whereas on time has the meaning of completing an action or completing something at a scheduled time. Next question. Next question is from Wan Fang Chen. Hi, Wan Fang. Hey, Alicia, what does you just made my day mean? I heard this phrase, but I don't fully understand it. Yeah, so you made my day is a really positive phrase. You can imagine this as you just made my day much better, but we don't say much better. So we use this when someone gives us good news. We can say you just made my day or you made my day. Just sounds like something happened very recently. You just made my day. A raise? You just made my day. We get to take the afternoon off? You just made my day. Those are situations where someone is really happy and wants to express that the other person improved their day in that moment. Nice expression. Next question. Our next question comes from Gerson Silva. Hi. What is the difference between shade and shadow? Oh, great. This is a great question. Both of these words can be used to refer to a place that is darker than its surroundings because there's an object that is blocking the light. We can say there's shade over there or there's a shadow over there. In that sentence, they are used the same. However, shadow refers to the dark shape only. So a person can cast a shadow. We use cast, the verb cast with a shadow. I cast a shadow when I stand in the sun, for example. Shade, however, as a noun, refers to or has the nuance of a kind of shelter. So shelter provided by some other object shelter from the light, shelter from the sun. So we would say stand in the shade because shade has the nuance of shelter. We would not say stand in the shadow. Shadow does not carry the nuance of shelter in the way that shade does. 
Interestingly enough though, shade and shadow are both used as verbs as well. To shadow something means to follow something closely. To shadow someone at work means to follow someone at work and, and try to understand their job, for example. Shade is used as a verb to mean to create shelter from light. For example, the canopy shaded us from the sun. Uh, shade also has some interesting uses. You might hear the slang phrase to throw shade. Throwing shade is a really interesting slang expression that we use, which means to communicate disrespect or to, to communicate like contempt, uh, bad feelings for something. When you're speaking generally, in most cases, uh, when you want to talk about a dark, cool area, you should say shade, stand in the shade. When you want to talk only about the dark area, that dark object, use shadow. Next question comes from Kelso Moreno. You wrote your name in all caps. Back to back, what does it mean? Sometimes I hear it in baseball games. <laughs> do you know? Yes, I do know. The expression back to back means one thing after another. So we have two things, sometimes more, back to back to back. You can put that in a line. It means um, in baseball, for example, like one home run after another, we could say two home runs back to back. Two or more things happening quickly in succession. It's used a lot in sports. Next question, actually two questions from Danny. Hi Danny. Danny's first question is, you talked about lit as slang. Yes, I talked about lit in episode two. Episode one, episode two of Ask Alicia. Can you please talk about the verb light and using it in active and passive? Sure, light means to start a fire. So to light a fire, to light a candle. Some examples of active and passive voice with this verb then. Why don't we light some candles for dinner tonight? All the candles in the restaurant were lit. On our camping trip, my neighbors lit a fire and we brought uh, hamburgers to make. A fire was lit in the campsite while we were gone. I was going to light a fire, but I fell asleep. So to light means to start a fire. He lit the house on fire. We can say to light blah 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 on fire. So there are a few different examples of using the verb uh, light in active and in passive, past tense, future tense as well. So I hope that that's helpful. Danny's second question, can you talk about ride and its uses? Like take someone for a ride. Can I take a ride? Ride is another verb that has a lot of different uses. You use the example to take someone for a ride means to drive together with someone. To go for a ride has the nuance of doing something just for fun. It's just for fun. I want to take a ride to a location. I want to take a ride to the mountains this weekend or take a ride to the beach. But to take someone for a ride means to invite someone to drive somewhere with you in a car. That's one way to use ride. You can also say, give me a ride. Can you give me a ride? So this is a request expression. I don't have a car. My friend has a car. I want my friend to take me in their car to a location. I can say, can you give me a ride to the movie theater? Can you give me a ride to the lake? Give me a ride is a request. So give me a ride in your car. So there are a lot of uses of ride. If you want to see all of them, or if you want to see more of them, I recommend checking a dictionary. There are quite a few, and I can't talk about them all in this video. So please check a dictionary. Next question is from Anderson Souza. Anderson Souza, hi Anderson. Anderson asks, hi Alicia, how are you doing? I'm reading Harry Potter and I just saw the sentence, good night Harry, how do you pronounce good night? Yeah, good night. We sometimes say good night, good night, so that Good in good is dropped. We remove that good sound and we say good night, good night, or good night. That's how you say it. Hope that helps. Next question. Okay, next question is from Fem. 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 What does you're too good to be true mean? Is it good? or not. Maybe you've heard this in a famous song, you're too good to be true, can't take my eyes off of you. In that case, it's a good meaning. A different way to say this expression is you are so good, you are so amazing that I can't believe you're real. So in other words, something must be wrong. There must be some problem with you. It's not possible for you to be real because you are so good, you are so great. So you're too good to be true. It's like, Wow, I'm amazed by you. So it's a good expression. If, however, uh, maybe in a more uncommon situation, someone said like, ah, eh, this guy's too good to be true. Like maybe reviewing a job application, for example. Uh, this girl, she's too good to be true. Like if it's said in that way, maybe there's something suspicious about that person. This doesn't seem right. There's just too much good information here. There must be some problem with this person. Depending on the intonation, it can portray either a very positive meaning or a very 
very suspicious mean. In most cases, however, it's a positive mean. So if you heard this in a song, for example, it's probably a very positive, kind of romantically nuanced phrase. Thanks very much for that question, Sam. Nice one. Next question is from Boz Rocha Jr. Sorry, I hope I said that right. Uh, Alicia, how do we separate words in a text when we get to the end of the line? Your text formatting software should do that for you. If you use Word, Word should do that for you. If you use just text or notepads, uh, there should be a word wrap function. I don't know. Google it. Google it if that doesn't help you. Your second question though, what is the difference in pronunciation between life and live or live? Uh, for example, my life is good and two, I live in a big city. Right. So life and the word that's spelled L-I-V-E, as in your example, I live in a big city, have different pronunciations. The vowel pronunciation of the I sound is different. In life, it's a very open sound, life, like life, life. In the second word, uh, live, the I sound is kind of tall, li, li. It's very like kind of in your nose, live. That's the first sound that's a bit different. So li, 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 li. <laughs> that's, the, that's the I sound that's different. Um, but then the consonant sound is also different. The F in life. So there's, there's just air coming out of my mouth. I'm not making any sound with my vocal cords there. Just life, life. With the word live, however, I'm making a v, v sound. So v, v. That's the difference. V, v. So I have to, I have to use my vocal cords v, to make the v sound. So life, no vocal cords. Live, vocal cords used. However, do be careful. Live, L-I-V-E, can also be pronounced live. So that V sound I talked about where you use your vocal cords plus that open I sound, live. So like a live performance, for example. So you need to pay attention to the grammar of the sentence to understand if it's live or live as well. So life and live have very different pronunciations. Good one. Nice catch. I hope you can practice those. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Next question. Rabia Arshad. Ra Rabia Arshad. Rabia Arshad. Sorry, I'm very tired. What's the difference between can and may? I saw this on the dining like a champ cheat sheet and noticed these words were used for requests. Uh, what's the difference? Can and may for requests in modern English, in modern American English are used the same. If I use them in a statement, can refers to ability, may refers to permission. Please just be careful. Can and may are only used in the same way uh, to make requests in modern American English. Next question is from Harley. Hi, Harley. Hello again. What is the correct use? It's I have breakfast, I have lunch, I have dinner, or I breakfast, I lunch, I dinner, I dine. Ah, nice question, Harley. I use the I have lunch, I have dinner, I have breakfast version. If you drop have, you sound very posh. Posh means like uh, fashionable, sophisticated, a bit rich as well. So I'm not any of those things, but saying I breakfast, I lunch, I dinner. It sounds like you have a very high opinion of that activity. In most cases, at least in my life, I don't have a reason to speak like that. So I always say I have breakfast or I have lunch or I have dinner. It's not incorrect to say I breakfast, I lunch, I dine, but it sounds a bit unnatural in most uh, everyday life situations. You don't really need to talk with that level of formality, I don't think. Next question. Next question is from Ferris. Faris Ghazali? Faris Ghazali? I'm very sorry. Faris asks, hey Alicia, can we use hasn't in an essay? Hasn't, the contracted form of has not. You can, it's physically possible for you to use hasn't in an essay, sure. But if you use contractions in your writing, it makes you, in my opinion, it makes you sound a bit less formal. If you use the expanded form, the un, the non-contracted version, you're going to sound a bit more formal, a bit more polished, I feel. This does not only apply to the word has not and hasn't, therefore. This applies to all contractions, really. The answer is yes, you can, but I don't necessarily recommend it if you want to sound uh, formal and polished. Thanks for that question, though, Ferris. Next question, what does the word lit mean? What does the word lit mean? Lit is actually a slang word. It's common 
slang among young people, especially in the U.S. right now. Uh, maybe many of you know that uh, the verb to light has the past tense uh, lit. Lit is used to talk about, for example, a party or um, some kind of social gathering, usually, that's really exciting or that's really, really fun or that's kind of crazy. So lit, using the past tense there, you can kind of imagine that like a fire, when you light a fire, it maybe it gets bigger and it gets kind of wild, a little bit crazy, like there's a spark and then it starts. So if you see the word lit, like this party was lit, it means it was really crazy, it was really good, it was really fun. Uh, you can use it if you want, but just keep in mind that really young people use that word. I don't use that word for reference, but again, I'm not the expert. First question. First question this week comes from Iman. Again, hi Iman, you send lots of questions. Thanks. Which one is correct? I want rest or I want to take rest? Uh, well, you can say I want rest to mean in general just you would like to do nothing to relax. Um, grammatically though, I want to take a rest is correct or I want to rest. Both of those are correct. However, in American English, we don't usually say I want to take a rest. It's more common to say I want to take a break. I want to take a break or let's take a break or can we take a break? Something like that is more common. You can say I want to take a rest, but again, in American English, rest is less common. Next question. What is correct? I thought you were gone or I thought you are gone. I thought you are gone. We need to use I thought you were gone here. I thought you were gone. So I thought, past tense, and you were is also past tense. It's a past tense thought, past tense situation. Um, so please use past tense. Yeah. Next question from Gabriella. Hi, Gabriella. Uh, hi, Alicia. What is the difference between used to and used to in fast speech? The difference in pronunciation. Yeah. Um, Basically, when we're speaking quickly, or I suppose even not quickly, we tend to pronounce used to as used to. The grammar doesn't change, uh, it's just the pronunciation changes because it's difficult to say used to very quickly. I used to, I used to. It's very difficult to say, so we just say used to instead. I used to use a smartphone. He used to play soccer. We used to cook every day. In each of these sentences, I contracted used to to used to. I think actually in most cases, we probably do say used to instead of used to because it's quite difficult to say. Again, this shouldn't really cause any communication problems. Used to and used to have the same meaning, just different pronunciation. Ah, next question, also maybe about were and was. Why do we use if I were and not if I was? Uh, this is a great question, and actually a lot of native speakers make mistakes with this. It's a small point, to be fair, but if you want to be correct, uh, you should always use if I were. Um, this is a grammar point. Uh, it refers to the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood. It's a, an explanation of subjunctive. It's a bit beyond the scope. It's a bit much for this video. Um, but we will always use if I were. Um, when the subject there is I in the conditional, if I were, we always use were. You will hear native speakers say if I was, if I was. If you want to be extremely strict and extremely nitpicky, um, were is actually the correct one. But uh, if you use was, if you make a mistake and you use was, you will still be understood. So, um, but yes, this is related to the subjunctive mood in English. Next question from Suinte. Suinte, hope I said that right. Suinte says, hi Alicia, which word do you prefer using as an American? America, the United States, the United States of America, the US, the USA, or the States. I only started using America to refer to my country when I moved to Japan because the people around me use the word America to refer to the country. But I think before that, I said uh, the US. I used the US. People would say, where are you from? The US. Why did I use the US? Because it's short and easy to say, the US. I don't want to say the United States of America. It sounds long to me. Thanks for the question. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.